As a culture, we don't have much practice in being alone. Even though Western culture is unusual, ever since the 19th century people have tended to have their own bedrooms more than any other time in history or any other culture in history. And you'd think that because of that we'd have some skills at being by ourselves. But it's very rarely the case. When you're alone in your room, you're not really alone. You may have books or magazines or the internet, TV, whatever. And so we don't have much practice in being alone, looking after ourselves. There's that chant we had just now, may I look after myself with ease. And it doesn't mean just physically being at ease, but also learning how to look after your own mind, getting a sense of how to correct its imbalances. And this is one of the, the treasures that the Buddha's teachings have to offer. And then it gives us some, some pointers on how to look after yourself, how to be alone and not go crazy and not get off balance, learning how to be self-correcting, self-governing. Several years back when the book End of the Wild came out, I was struck by how much the protagonist had to kind of reinvent the wheel and figure out how to have an authentic life, how to be alone facing the wilderness, and facing the wilderness of his own mind. And he didn't have that much to draw on. He had a few books, a little bit of Thoreau, a little bit of Tolstoy, and a lot of ideas, most of which were untested. And I couldn't help thinking, if you'd been born in Thailand, they have a whole tradition, a whole institution, with wisdom on how to be alone, i.e. the Buddhist teachings, and an opportunity to learn from people who had time alone and come out stronger as a result. So it's good to look into the Buddhist teachings and not only in terms of techniques for the meditation, but also attitudes you need to have in order to look after yourself. And the techniques are important. It gives you a good measuring stick for how things are going as you're being alone. It gives you something specific to do, to focus on, to create a sense of well-being in the present moment by being with your breath. And at the very least, learning how to approach whatever mind state is coming in and oppressing you, learning how to approach it from the physical side. Mind states all have an effect on the breath, but the breath can also have an effect on them. And if you're not skillful, it can become a, a vicious circle. You start breathing in weird ways, and that puts you in a bad mood, and then the bad mood makes the breathing get even stranger, and then you go spiraling down. So working with the techniques of breath meditation is one way of cutting those vicious circles, giving you a handle. On your state of mind. But it's also important that you learn how to step back from your state of mind and learn how to evaluate it. One, to see where your thinking has gone off course, and secondly, to realize that you don't have to be immersed in a mood. One of the principles of karma is that we have the freedom of choice in the present moment. And this is one area where our culture gets in the way. We tend to think that our moods are our real self. We don't trust our thoughts, because we know we picked up a lot of our thoughts from the, the media and other people around us. But our moods seem to, seem to be genuinely ours, who we are in the present moment. This is where the Buddhist teachings on understanding yourself are important. You don't have to identify with your mood. There's always a spot in the mind that's just simply aware of these things. And you want to learn how to stand in that spot. Again, the meditation is helpful in this regard. 
is it teaches you to create a state of mind and then step back and look at it. As in the John Lee's old image of the, the basket maker. You make a basket and then you step back and you look at it. Is it too long, too short? Is the weaving coarse or irregular? And see where there's things that are not right, and then you'd make another one and another one. And if you could learn to look at your moods as a basket, i.e. not who you really are, but something something that you've created, then you can start working on the raw materials and make a better one. But it's important that you have this ability to step back. One of the images in the canon is of a person sitting down who's looking at someone who's lying down, or a person standing who's looking at someone sitting down. In other words, you step back a bit and you're slightly above what's just happened, and you evaluate it. That's the second part. Not only having a place to step back, but also having good standards to evaluate things. And for instance, when you're in a bad mood, there's this tendency, especially here in the West, to say, well, this is, I'm finally being honest with myself, and I'm miserable, and I'm horrible, and my life is going nowhere. We tend to think that that's getting down to the reality of the situation. But why should we believe that? And why is it? In what way is it helpful? We might say, well, it's better to be realistic than living in fantasies. But your bad mood is just a mood. It doesn't guarantee the truth of what you see during those times. And it's also really self-defeating, because a lot of the, the Buddha's teachings on your feelings and your moods come down to your ability to gladden the mind when it needs to be gladdened. In other words, to use the mood as an aid in the practice. Get some, some perspective on the mood and realize what, it, what its shortcomings are. Back when I was first a monk, this was a very important part of the, the training, not only having the breath meditation technique to deal with whatever was coming up, but also having the opportunity to talk to someone, in other words, a John Fung who had a lot of experience in being alone and learning to gauge what was a healthy and what was an unhealthy mood, and how to realize that regardless of how true we might think the mood might be, you've got to look at its effect. Where is it leading you? After all, we're here to follow a path. So you can ask yourself, what kind of path is a depressed mood? What kind of path is a unhealthy mood. It's not a path at all. It's a path downward. It's not the path you want to follow. So again, remind yourself, you, these moods are not necessarily true. They're not necessarily you. You can choose to put them on like a set of clothing, or you can put them off. So you need the place to step back. You need the, a set of standards for judging what is healthy and what is not healthy, realizing that sometimes the things that we're supposed to abandon in the path are actually help. Like that sutta where Ananda is talking about how desire is often helpful in the path. Conceit can be helpful in the path. In other words, the desire to do well, the conceit that says, other people can do this, why can't I? Those are actually useful tools in the path. All the skills that we tend to associate with a healthy ego are also helpful in the path. In other words, learning how to anticipate danger, i.e. I see the danger and wallowing in a mood. The skills that allow you to suppress moods that you know are not helpful. I realize that I'm just not going to pick up this mood and go with it. Sublimation, which is actually finding another mood, another way of looking at things, replacing your current mood with a better one. Humor. The ability to laugh at your foibles, not in a nasty, sarcastic way, but in a good-natured, large-hearted way. And altruism, realizing that in learning to look after yourself, you're also helping other people. There's that famous sutta with the, t t the two acrobats, where they realize if I look after my sense of balance, and you look after your sense of balance. That's how we're going to get down from this pole that we're standing on. 
In other words, remind yourself that it's not a selfish thing to know how to look after yourself. It's actually a help to others, because if you can't look after yourself, you become a burden to other people. So this is why the Buddha, in his instructions on breath meditation, included the ability to gladden the mind when it needs to be gladdened, both in terms of the way you breathe and the way you learn to think and talk to yourself, the attitudes you have, your ability to step back and use the breath as a vantage point on whatever the depressed mood might be, and the set of values that help you to recognize that this is something you don't want to get involved with and all the other tools you learned as to how to change the mood by the way you breathe, by the way you look at things, by what you focus on and what you choose to just let go. There are also the skills of steadying the mind. When the mood, new mood is that you're trying to create is still unstable, what can you do to make it more and more solid? And then there's releasing, how to release the mind from its unskillful moods. And then even when you develop a skillful mood, then you say, okay, this can take me only so far. How about a more skillful mood? As that passage when the Buddha talks about the meditator who finds that as he's focusing on the breath, there's a fever in his mind. So he needs to change his topic for the time being, find something that's more inspiring, more uplifting. It could be something like reflecting on the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, whatever you find inspiring that relates to the Dharma. And then finally, when you've got the mind in a much better mood, okay, then you can go back to the breath, and then the, then the mind can really settle down. It can drop all that thinking and go to a place that's a lot more still, solid, and buoyant. So when you find yourself overtaken by a mood, or if you're not really sure about how you should approach when things are going poorly, or when things are going awfully well, sometimes we feel embarrassed to congratulate ourselves when the meditation is going well. Well, that doesn't help at all, because recognizing when the meditation is going well and learning how to appreciate it when it's going well will give you a reference point. When you start getting discouraged about the whole process, you can remember, well, there were times when it went well. And it's really worth it to put in the effort to get it back to being something that goes well again. So it's a combination of things. It's having the, the spot where you can step back and look at things, the right set of attitudes that help you gauge the situation for what it is, and then the skills that you need in order to create a better mood. Now, this is how you look after yourself with ease. In other words, the, the skills that enable you to just be more mature in general also help make you a better meditator. In this way, as you meditate, you become your own best friend instead of your own worst enemy. You learn how to handle being alone, and it's only when you can handle being alone that you can really handle being with other people, not get swept away by their ideas or their moods. And you can actually become a source of stability in their lives as well. So keep this in mind when, say, in the middle of an afternoon, things don't seem to be going so well. Get up and walk around a bit. Anything that works. One of my students, a monk in Thailand, once said that he'd get restless sometimes, so he'd just walk up and down a mountain a couple times just to get rid of the restlessness. Anything you find that helps get you out of an unskillful mood and into a more skillful one, it's an important part of the meditation.